Hello and welcome everybody. Thank you so much for being here. I'm Bruce Bond, co-founder and CEO of Common Ground Committee. We're so pleased to be co-presenting USC's Climate Forward Conference 2023, Bridging Divides, Sharing Solutions, with the USC Wrigley Institute for Environmental Studies and the USC Dornsife Center for the Political Future. We're also very pleased that we are this week a part of the National Week of Conversation. And on behalf of my colleagues at Common Ground Committee, Committee and our media partner, the Christian Science Monitor, thank you all for coming. The video you just saw gives you a little insight into our organization. We are a nonpartisan, citizen led nonprofit bringing light, not heat, to public discourse and working to bring healing to the problems of unhealthy, dis uh, unhealthy discourse and polarization that threaten our nation. This is our 21st public forum, and this discussion will address finding common ground in climate conversations. I'd like to encourage all of you to tweet and use the hashtags that we have up here uh, that you see on the screen. So let's get right to it. Uh, we just have such an incredible panel today, and I'm delighted to first introduce our moderator. He is the director of the Wrigley Institute for Environmental Studies, uh, Dana and David Dornsife Chair and Professor of Psychology and a Professor of Biological Sciences here at USC. His research focuses on environmental decision making in emotionally and politically charged situations. A frequent advisor to government, business, and NGOs, he is a current member of the EPA's Chartered Science Advisory Board. Please welcome Dr. Joe Arve. And next, our highly esteemed guests. He is the editor-in-chief of Sapir and a Pulitzer Prize-winning conservative columnist, columnist for the New York Times who has written about his evolving views on climate change. He is the recipient of the 2019 Ellis Island Medal of Honor and three honorary doctorates, and I hear he's been banned in Russia. <laughs> Please welcome Brett Stevens. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. She is one of the nation's most respected voices on climate change, the environment, and public health. She was the first ever White House National Climate Advisor and former EPA Administrator. As head of the Climate Policy Office under President Biden, she has led the most aggressive action on climate in U.S. history, including putting a new national target to cut greenhouse gas emissions by 2030 within reach. Please welcome Gina McCarthy. And thank you all again so much for being with us. Joe, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot, Bruce. And thank you very much to the Common Ground Committee. Thank you to the artists that were here earlier. And thank you to our CPF partners here at Climate Forward. Uh, I'm delighted to be here with such an impressive group of people. Uh, as before, Brett, Gina, and I will talk for about an hour. We'll then have half an hour for questions from the audience, including students who are attending watch parties up on the big screen at Michigan State University, Go Green, uh, the University of Notre Dame, and Vanderbilt University. Uh, and just in the interest of full Disclosure, I was an EPA science advisor for uh, Gina McCarthy back in 2017, but uh, we'll still have a heated conversation anyway. No, a, li a lit, a well-lit conversation anyway. So let's get started. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with you uh, first, Brett. Um, your thinking on climate change has evolved. I think it's safe to say that perhaps you were a skeptic. You had called for forestalling action on climate change in an article that you wrote in 2017 until there was more certainty. Uh, but this October, you wrote uh, a column for the New York Times documenting how your opinions had shifted uh, after taking a trip to Greenland where you witnessed firsthand the extent of what's actually happening in the world around us. Can you help us understand what was actually standing in the way prior to your uh, uh, article in October uh, of last year, standing in the way of you accepting the consensus on climate change, that it was something that we needed to address uh, now? First of all, I'm honored and delighted uh, to be here. Um, so much nicer to be in Southern California than in Northern New York, um, uh, for many reasons, including the climate. Um, uh, 
The minute I hear the word consensus, I want to contradict it. That just is in my bones. Uh, and uh, we were having this conversation uh, earlier today, but I've been a contrarian all my life. And so I think if there had been less of a consensus, maybe I would have been uh, more uh, open to, be to being persuaded. I wasn't a climate skeptic in, that, in the sense that I denied the anthropogenic human-caused contributions to a, a, a warming planet. But I was more skeptical about the uh, consensus that this was um, not just a problem like many problems, but a uh, unique uh, global uh, catastrophe. Now, what changed for me wasn't really my understanding of the facts. Um, my understanding of the facts, I think, was reasonably solid before I came to the Times. And it, I mean, I, I know more now simply with the passage of time, but that's not what really changed. What changed for me was my perception of risk. And if anything, uh, uh, what moved me to reconsider questions of risk um, had as much to do with the pandemic as they did with uh, climate in that in the pandemic, we all experienced how nature can um, overwhelm even a highly advanced, scientifically grounded civilization with uh, devastating consequences in uh, human life, social relations, the way that the whole structure of our civilization at a pace with a suddenness that few people really anticipated on the eve of, of the pandemic. The other thing that happened is uh, less about kind of a, a rethinking questions of risk and, and more a social thing. Um, and and, and it's, a, it's a small story, but it's worth telling. When I got to the Times, uh, several thousands, tens of thousands of people signed petitions demanding that I be fired on account of my views of climate. <laughs> Amazingly, this did not endear me to those people. Um, uh, one of the people who signed one petition was an oceanographer named John uh, Englander, who runs something called the Rising Seas Institute. And uh, about an hour, about a, a year after I'd written that that initial controversial uh, column, I got a, a, an email, I think, really out of the blue. Never heard of this guy saying, "Look, I'm an oceanographer." I'm embarrassed to say I signed a petition demanding that you be fired, but I've been reading you for a year and you seem like an okay guy. Uh, I'd like to come meet with you, if that's okay. And so I said, sure. You know, I, I was eager to meet with, with anyone who wasn't going to demand that I get, lose my job. So Englander came. He said, look, I'm taking uh, high-level groups of people to Greenland to see in a visible way what um, uh, warming uh, temperatures are doing to the ice sheet in in, in Greenland, I'd like you to come. And he was so uh, congenial and decent and open that it seemed crazy for me to say no. Also, I'm a journalist, and it's a free junket to a place I've never been. So of course, I was going to say yes. But he, there was the fact is that he did not approach me either as an imbecile or as, an, uh, as, as a bad guy. He approached me as a guy he wanted to have a conversation with. And I think that's really important when we have conversations across differences. If your operating assumption is that someone who thinks differently from you must be um, stupid or must be bad, the conversation is going to be a failure at the start. If you go into the conversation, on the other hand, with a view that this person is not necessarily your enemy. This person might be coming from an honest place of doubt. Then you're likely to have a productive conversation. And in fact, that's exactly what happened. Our trip to Greenland was interrupted by the, by the pandemic. And then, of course, I went and the visible evidence of seeing the ice sheet retreat, seeing uh, the lakes of water on the ice sheet, um, seeing the retreat of some of the largest glaciers in the world, and just the scale of that retreat was, was a, 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 a moving and profound experience. Well, that's something I want to explore a little bit more. But before we get there, I want to turn to, to you, Gina, and again, go back to 2017. One of the things that Brett wrote in his piece in October, the one that garnered all the hate mail and petitions, uh, he wrote that. No, that was the good piece. Oh, that, OK. <laughs> My apologies. The bad piece was in April from six years ago. OK. 
<laughs> oh, you're right. Yes, of course. I'm sorry. My confusion. But nevertheless, he wrote in his first hate mail uh, inducing uh, piece <laughs> that he thought the climate science was generally scrupulous, but that those who were looking at the science and pushing for more stringent climate legislation weren't necessarily as scrupulous. You were the administrator of the EPA uh, shortly before that piece came out. Would you agree with Brett? And as a follow-up, if I take you back to 2017 and earlier, perhaps when the Obama administration was working on the Clean Power Plan, as an EPA administrator, how did you justify taking action on climate at a time where, well, I would argue the science was pretty darn certain, it certainly wasn't as certain as it is today? Well, the law required it <laughs> is, is probably the best answer, and the science was very strong. You know, it may not have been compelling to, to some folks, but when you, when you looked at it, the, I think the challenge that I tried to overcome, Joe, and you'd, you'd relate to this, is that, you know, the problem at, at, at that point in time was that, you know, the way science talks is so foreign to the way people want to hear things. You know, the, the, it, it was the. I was at EPA when, when we had a team of folks doing all of the underpinnings for the analytics on how you move forward to regulate on climate, and they spent months and have documents after documents that were filed with Congress, and and the the that the, they came in and they came running in and said the IPPC report is is here, and the IPCC says that. That, that climate is is very very likely to uh, be be caused by warming or something like that. And I said, well, that's great. How's that different? Well, there's another very in it. And I'm like, well, that is <laughs> hard a hard act to follow, right? So we are we waiting for the third very? The problem is that scientists got so excited about climate, and they translate that into the language of science that isn't translatable easily into how you talk to normal human beings about risk and normal human beings about what it means for them. So, you know, I, I, I have no problem with people questioning scruples of this, that, or the other thing. But I do think that at EPA, we did a hell of a job trying to make sure that we were following what we were told to do and listening to the science. And that's all we could do. And for years, that was all we could do until it made a considerable shift. And that shift, I think, was when we could actually do something about it. Then you could talk about the benefits of all the actions you take on climate, not just try to convince people that we're in a dire situation that's going to get worse. Because I don't know about you, but to me, I have a hard time exciting people by telling them they're going to die any moment, or they'll die in 20 years from now if they don't do this. What you have to tell them is that we're in a tough situation, but we have a way out of it, and your life will be better off for it. And so the entire time, Joe, which you probably know from being at EPA, you know, I was the first person that ever demanded that we call ourselves a public health agency. CDC called me and said, no, you're not we are. I said, well, you, you two can play at this game, right? It's all about public health. That's all we ever measured. We measured how many more lives would be saved. Then we measured cost because we had to. But in the end, that was a really good story as well. So we loved it. And I think that this is, th these things evolve and not everybody evolves at the same pace and not everybody looks at the same data. But I think that we did a good job in moving, but it would have been great if we could have moved more quickly. You know, it's, it's interesting. I remember working for a, a Republican administrator of the EPA, and I remember sort of the, the, the buzz around EPA at the time was that our job was to protect people from the environment. And then when Lisa Jackson came in, and then when you came in, it was to protect the environment from people. Yeah. So it was this really interesting pivot. I wonder where we are today. I'm going to go off script already. It's going to drive the directors crazy as I look at them. Uh, Brad, I'm going to go back to something that Gina was just talking about in your piece back in 2017. Are people who are pushing for action on climate change today more scrupulous than they were uh, when you wrote the piece uh, six years ago? I don't know how to answer that. I wouldn't know how to, how to measure it. My, my point, actually, in that column 
uh, which maybe was uh, it could have made better, um, like like most columns, by the way. Um, it was short. It was a very short piece. Uh, well, the, a lot of anger from such a short piece. Uh, uh, Do you feel surrounded at times? <laughs> <laughs> so, so my point was that I don't think that public messaging by some aspects of the climate activist community helps make the case to the general public that we have a really gigantic uh, challenge on our hands. And when you message that unless we take action by the year 2020, climate change becomes irreversible, and I bet you can Google people saying in the year 2000 that 2020 is date certain, after that it's game over, right? Guess what? Ultimately, well, here we are in 2023. I guess it's game over. We're just going to sit back, relax, you know, bake in the sun and die, right? It's not helpful. It's not helpful messaging. If you say that the Himalayas, the Himalayas are going to lose all of their glaciers by, I don't know, the middle of this century, which is wrong and preposterous, you are harming your case by raising alarm so that it's a classic case of a boy. But Brett, every, every big issue like this has a zillion constituencies but, 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 and you can't pick and choose and say those few are, are bad so they're not scrupulous. And did you ever write an article about whether you think the fossil fuel companies were scrupulous when they talked about climate change? If, if, I, if, I, if, I, can, if I can just finish what I was okay, saying. Okay. okay, sorry. Okay. All right. I'll um, what if the climate community had said, um, guess what, in, in your lifetime, you're probably not going to see huge consequences for climate. But think of discovering that you have stage two breast cancer, okay? You can go to sleep and wake up many mornings and feel absolutely fine. But anyone who has the knowledge that they have stage two breast cancer knows that it's much wiser to take action sooner than it is to take action later. And I think the analogy with climate actually holds. The question is, does it cost us more to deal with the challenge now rather than kick the can down the road? Or should we kick the can down the road in 100 years and, and then see you know, where we are then? And what changed with my, my thinking was I used to think, look, in 100 years, the global economy will probably be vastly richer than it is today. If you just look back 100 years ago, we're a much richer society now than we were in 19, 1923. We'll be scientifically much more advanced. We'll have means at our disposal to deal with a crisis then that we won't have now. So this used to be my thinking. Now my thinking is, well, if the right metaphor is cancer, right, then you want to deal with it now, not in a hundred, not in a hundred years' time. And I think that if the climate community, just to get to your question, the climate community were, were, were offering that message, you would find a lot of people who are now either indifferent or skeptical or hostile much more receptive to thinking about acting now, including, including in the way in which we currently use fossil fuels. So I just, for the, for the sake of saying it, I, I've often thought of climate change not so much as cancer, but as kind of an endemic virus, one that we have to sort of you know, understand and begin to deal with over time. So I think I agree with you. Um, but I want to, picking up on this theme of viruses, Brett talked about COVID. Gina, you wrote a piece, no, you actually recorded a piece for WBUR in Boston uh, about COVID-19. To Brett's point about looking at COVID-19 as a wake-up call around climate, do you have any lessons that you draw from your observations? observations of COVID-19 uh, as a pandemic and what that means for how we think about climate change and how we'll ultimately uh, respond to it? Let me, let me respond in this way, and this is, uh, maybe it's not an exact answer to your question, because I'm, uh, but the, the pandemic was to me a big wake up call <laughs> about how we could all fall apart so quickly. And, and there were so many um, very differing opinions on how to resolve this issue. But what I wanted to raise 
was that, you know, the, the reason why I went back to work uh, in the White House uh, with President Biden was because he was taking over, you know, as, as president at a time when it could not have been more difficult. <laughs> we were at a very low point in terms of, of COVID and people's sense of loss, their concern, their anger, their frustration. And he, in, in conversations with President Biden, he made it extraordinarily clear to me that he was totally committed to climate action. And he believed that climate action was actually the way to rebuild the United States of America at that point in time. As a result of the pandemic, we had jobs we need to deliver. We had changes in rebuilding we needed to do. He needed a positive message around that. And he actually, for the first time ever, turned climate back around as an economic solution to that challenge. Because, again, we have solutions now. That's why I went back. Nobody had ever done anything but run away when I went to see them about climate change. Because to them it was always, oh, God, costs. Oh, God, like you're talking about, the world is going to end tomorrow. And, and that completely changed. And that's what the bipartisan infrastructure law and the Inflation Reduction Act was. It was an investment in rebuilding the United States in a way Way that would grow jobs, in a way that would advance equity, and in a way that would make us much more resilient to the challenges of climate. And I thought that was just a framing that could not be beaten. And was that right? Well, you know what I mean. Uh, and, and, you know, it, it engaged the unions for the first time. It brought businesses to the table saying, how do we resolve this issue? We're all, you know, floundering. And it provided a basis for change that I thought was a, a remarkable acceleration uh, in terms of, of how fast it could ramp up um, and actually make a meaningful change. And that's been amazing to me. I'm going to stay with you for a second because Brett talked about how his thinking on climate change had evolved in particular yeah. as a result of the pandemic and then his trip uh, to Greenland. Has your thinking on climate change evolved one way or the other? Perhaps, you know, you mentioned business just now. It wasn't something that we talked about a lot 10 years ago as business yeah. being at the table on climate. Yeah. How has your thinking evolved about climate change over the past several years? Well, I think it, 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 as, as much as it's weird for me to say this, uh, I mean, I, I'm beginning to quote James Carville all the, all the time. It's about the economy, stupid. I, I, you know, and, and I don't mean that to diminish that it's about health, it's about the planet and the, the, the global challenge that we're facing. But, if, but it really is a, fr a, a hugely winning framing when you have millions of people not working. <laughs> It's hugely compelling when you can actually advance, you know, buildings in different ways, when you can rebuild roads and bridges to be more resilient, when you can actually preserve natural resource areas that for, for yourself and your kids. These are compelling issues that actually all follow, I think, the framing of how we wanted, how, how we thought the world could and should be given an opportunity to change, at least in the U.S., if not beyond, with the lens of understanding that climate change was no longer a sacrifice, it was the road to abundance. And there's been articles and op-eds written about this lately, where people are beginning to realize that this is, this is a framing that changes everything on climate. It's not about when do we have to make a change, it's how do we advance and accelerate that change, hopefully at the pace that science demands but recognizing that very often when change gets moving and is fundamentally built into a system, it just goes faster and faster. And what I'm seeing now is that businesses and private sector are jumping all over this. The only thing we have to make sure of is that the solutions they're looking to invest in are both meaningful and will work, 
but also that they are, in the case of the Global South and others where folks are trying to invest, that they're culturally appropriate instead of just tossing in a solar panel in a country that has no wastewater or, or water infrastructure. That's probably not going to be the healthiest way to build an economy there. So I'm going to I'm going to try and thread a needle here. When I read your piece from last fall, as I was sort of scrolling through the, you know, it was this very sort of VRE or a sort of, uh, yeah. you know, it was a very nice piece. You have good graphic artists at the New York Times. Um, good it, writers too. Uh, <laughs> yes, yes, I should have said that. Wonderful writers at the New York Times. Um, you said uh, that markets could be the answer to climate change, or at least that was one of the headlines as I scrolled through, that markets could be uh, uh, an answer or a solution. Gina just talked about business. The needle I'm trying to thread is one of common ground. Am I starting to detect that the two of you might be landing in the same place uh, with respect to the role that uh, markets and business can play? So, so Gina said something that I think I, is, first of all, something I agree with completely, and it's also well and wisely put, um, the road to abundance. Uh, Part of, I think, the, the, the problem with a lot of the messaging around climate is um, basically eat your broccoli, uh, consume less, walk lightly upon the earth. The future is going to be one of less and less, and uh, and you just have to suck it up. And, and that may feel, make people feel certain people feel virtuous, but I don't think that's a winning message for most Americans, most people in the world who think their lives should be, as you said, more abundant than their parents were and, 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 and successively yep. through generations. And as a matter of fact, I think it's really the only way in which we get to the kinds of climate solutions that we need, many of which we haven't thought of yet, either because the technology isn't available or we haven't thought through where, where, where the intersection of technology, efficiency, regulation most fruitfully, uh, most fruitfully lies. So just to give you one example, um, we could be doing amazing climate work, not by having all of you buy EVs, um, where actually when you kind of look deeply at it, it's, it's a slightly more fraught question. Uh, triple pane windows insulate your houses. Houses are, are, are 100 year, sometimes 200 year investments. Energy efficient homes are an incredibly good, economically efficient, and essentially largely invisible cost. It's really something that's smart to do because we're going to have to start tackling the climate issue not through two answers but through hundreds of answers. That's that's like one of them. Water efficiency is another. Right now the state of Arizona uses um, about 80% of its um, agriculture is flood irrigation. They're basically um, growing crops the way Babylonians did 10,000 years ago. It's insane. We know from from uh, Israel for instance, other, other countries that, that use drip irrigation or even more advanced forms of irrigation, you can be extraordinarily uh, efficient. It's good for farmers. It's good for the environment. It's a really smart thing to do. We might find that the road to an energy transition is going to be a mix of a, a whole bunch of things. It's not just going to be windmills if you're windy and solar panels if, 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 you're, if it's a solar country. It'll be something, something else. So, I mean, I, I'm going to get into trouble with someone quoting Mao Zedong here, but this is like it has to be a let a thousand flowers bloom campaign. And it's not going to come, and I say this with, with high respect for Gina, from the minds of our or you for that matter, the minds of clever EPA administrators. It's going to come from entrepreneurs who are probably in this room right now who are thinking about how they put their environmental passions together with their entrepreneurial abilities and find something nobody has thought of before. That's how we usually get out of our, our jams in, in, in the 21st century. But I, the only thing I, I would add, I don't disagree with anything you, you said, but I think just to expand it a little bit the the I think what President Biden was trying to accomplish with the bipartisan infrastructure law was good because in every community you'll be able to see something happening that benefits you right it's it's a good solid case in the in, in the infrastructure uh, 
no, what's it called? Inflation Reduction Act. That that was an accelerator. <laughs> and I think the, the the only thing I want to point out is the markets are now growing because in, there's an accelerator that lowers the cost of each of those things and actually entices markets to develop in private sector to engage. That is a one-time, hopefully, accelerator that will really get these markets moving. And we did not have this kind of capacity to draw in private sector investment until the Inflation Reduction Act. That it was it was going elsewhere because many of the things these these products can be sold somewhere else less cheaply, that uh, uh, less less expensive uh, than in the U.S. So I'm excited about it, but I don't think it's it. I don't think markets generate themselves. I think that I think the Inflation Reduction Act was a signal to the market that we're open for business in a way that's never been done before. And so that's been a huge, I think, and will be a huge game changer. I can't not let the conservative respond to, to that, the interplay between markets yeah. and regulation. Look, I'm, I'm not like some, you know, knee-jerk libertarian who's against every uh, government intervention, and there's no question, and I think, you know, a really solid basis for saying that smart government intervention and investment um, smart, uh, underscore, um, uh, can create technologies, markets, opportunities that wouldn't have existed otherwise, particularly since the other side of my argument is that climate change is a concern for us in 100 years. So how, you know, you're not going to incentivize markets that are looking at the next quarter to think about 100 years hence, but you can create incentives. You just have to be sure that you're not, that the government doesn't end up in the business of picking winners and losers, because that is a, a road to, uh, to sorrow for the government, because you end up with, with companies that don't pan out or rich people getting $7,000 subsidies that they don't need so they can, they, can, they can own a car they could have afforded uh, anyway. You get a lot of solutions that don't quite work. You know, the way that markets work is that the things you don't think work somehow end up working working and the things that seem like, like great bets do. So you just have to be careful that when the government invests, it's doing so by saying we're open to lots of ideas and we're not choosing anyone in particular. I think that's, that, that's, that's really the key. The other thing I would mention, we were just talking uh, in the green room just before coming on stage, we have a mutual friend, uh, Cass Sunstein, who's a, um, well, he's in, in the administration, but he's also a professor at, at Harvard. And you know, Cass is a great believer in the theory of nudging right like the, the, the annoying sound when you don't buckle your seatbelt right is a nudge and it's hugely effective in getting people to buckle up the government That's can, the name of his earlier book yeah. just wrote another one the government can do a lot of nudging without regulating mm -hmm. um, it, it can be really smart about pushing people in the right direction without imposing laws that might have cons or regulations with consequences they don't quite foresee but here's the thing with nudging, and I'm, I can't help, this is my field, so I've, I've done a lot of work on nudging. Nudges don't make trade-offs for you, and the kinds of issues that we're talking about with respect to climate change. Uh, you well, can drive a car with, with an annoying sound going on. Yeah, but that's the designer of the car who's making the trade-off on your behalf, right? I, I do believe in the value of free choice, informed choice, and allowing people to actually pull the levers on the trade-offs that they're willing to make. In this sense, I'm starting to sound quite libertarian myself, but I really think that the complexity of the climate problem or the challenge is going to require us to consider multiple objectives coming from multiple voices, looking at multiple alternatives. These flowers that Mao spoke of, we're going to be evaluating. He eventually killed them all. But yeah, I know. <laughs> Portfolios of flowers that we're going to have to evaluate through time. That's going to be that's going to be quite tricky. But having said all that, I'm going to I'm going to take this as common ground just because I'm the moderator and I can. I'm going to say <laughs> that you two agree on the interplay between government and markets more or less as it as it relates to, to climate change. So I'm going to shift gears. Can here. I just say, in, course, in regulation everyone. is when markets don't work. You regulate when you don't have the ability to manage a market in a way that, that leaves human beings' health on the table 
for con the, without consideration. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I said that backwards, but you know what I mean. Yeah. You know that th you need regulation because markets don't always consider all of the consequences to human beings as much as they consider conse cost consequences and what can be made. Yeah. Just just the key That's thing all. is, the moment you get into five-year plans. You're screwed. I mean, we, we went through the 20th century realizing that huge government schemes, even if the smartest and the best people were behind them, were going to fail because the questions are much larger than any human mind. I mean, maybe, maybe AI is going to figure this one out for us. Um, Chat GPT will. Chat, well, it, uh, <laughs> after it starts writing my columns. Um, uh, Wait, it wasn't writing it already? <laughs> yeah. Well, they the first really column well. was Chat GPT. Okay. It was so I, I take notes. So just so you know, okay. uh, uh, but but you have to be careful. That there is there is a temptation, especially when you have a challenge as large uh, as climate, to become hubristic. That you can solve it through action that goes from the top down. It's, I think it's hugely important to believe that action that comes from the bottom up is more likely to be effective if properly regulated and I, if it's I done totally in a democratic framework. That. I think okay. climate solutions have been from the bottom up. We have actual common level, ground. I didn't even have to make state. it up. We have actual. Well, you could make ground. it up. I no, I don't. I, I would prefer not to. <laughs> this, this, this is this is at least as embarrassing to her as it is to me. <laughs> I'm glad that I can draw that out of both of you. That's my job, right? I'm going to deny this was ever happening. Yeah. Well, we're we're recording it. Can't you see? This is pretty. It's pretty elaborate. What's going on back there? Um, I'm going to move on and and talk about the future a little bit. Uh, and I'm going to start with you, Gina. Um, by when do we need, this is even a hard question to answer uh, or to ask, but by when do we need to, to, to make more serious strides than we're making today to avoid the most catastrophic consequences of climate change? About 20 years ago, probably. Yeah. yeah. It's, I mean, we, we will, we, you saw it, there's changes that you're not going to reverse. And so you have to be prepared to adapt. You just have to be. And I think part of the, um, the, the challenge is, is just going to be recognizing that and figuring out how to protect people against the, the most significant damage that we know will happen. You know, we just can't control and we can't undo some of these things. We're living in a different world. The issue is we, we have to move as fast as we can now uh, to invest in, in what, we need, what we have available to us. And I think part of the, part of the, the challenge you know, is going to be, I, I think that it, it seems to me that the U.S. right now, with the Inflation Reduction Act and, and the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law and the CHIPS Act and others, is really capturing a moment in time for us that's going to be important. The EU is now picking up on the same thing. They're actually starting to look at similar programs and initiate those. So you see it, but it, the developed world will be able to make, I think, considerable progress. The challenge is, how do we recognize this as a global problem? Yeah. <laughs> because you know we are simply not moving as quickly as we should to reduce the amount of greenhouse gases we contribute. And we're doing literally little to nothing for the small island nations and, and, and the global south to figure out how to address the problems that they're facing, not from their own, uh, for, from the, at their own hand, but because of us. You know, one of the things that drives me bonkers about talking with people about climate change is I often hear people say, we've got to do something now so we can go back to normal. And I always ask myself, what normal are you talking about? There's no about? now yeah, anymore. Yeah. There's just forever. I mean, yeah. we just have to act differently. But that difference will be tremendously important. If we didn't need fossil fuels, it would be really great. People don't recognize. I'm not just talking about greenhouse gas emissions. I'm talking about the the health implications from burning coal and burning other fossil fuels and what that means for the health and well-being of people. Get out a little bit. Look at what people are being exposed to. It's horrendous, even in the U.S. 
Go to Cancer Alley. Look at what's happening in these places. It's amazingly bad. And even though we have good laws, keeping up with that and making the change, you know it. It takes forever to do these things. Can I ask? Absolutely. Yeah, no. What's your feeling about nuclear? Oh, God. I was hoping you wouldn't ask me that. Um, I was going to ask you that, but yeah. we have a new moderator. I mean, I know that. I was just curious. Uh, you know, I. I, I it's okay. I don't, you know, I, I will not dismiss it, but it's not my favorite. Can I just put it that way? No. Can uh, you okay. tell us why it's not your favorite? Well, you, 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 got, wa you got waste. <laughs> you have waste, and we have nowhere to put it, and we're highly unsuccessful in finding a place to put it. And, and these, you know, and it, it raises a risk and a security challenge that's rather extreme. And you know the longer that sits around, something, you know, is, it, it's a temptation for those who would like to wreak havoc. So I, it's not my favorite, but I'm, I'm not dismissing it. Look, we're extending the life of these old nuclear pl plants way past their shelf life because it's biding us time to do other things. So it's not inherently bad. And some of these small nuclear rea nuclear modular uh, reactors may be very good. I just don't want to live in my neighborhood with my modular nuclear reactor down the street. It just doesn't. Give me hope. Do you want to ask for a follow-up? No, I, I, uh, but I, I'd like to discuss. <laughs> yeah, please. It's yeah. a really hugely important question. I think people fool themselves by saying there is a form of energy that's totally clean, it's totally great, yeah. and if it weren't for evil fossil fuel companies and dumb regulations and force of habit, everything would be fine. We'll all have, you know, uh, your average uh, um, uh, wind turbine, okay, takes up a huge amount of copper. Ever seen yeah. a copper mine? Yeah. Not clean, okay? It takes up a huge amount of rare earth. Where are we getting rare earth? You want electric vehicles? You're going to have to have lithium, you're going to have to have other minerals, many of which are coming from either Russia, not good, Democratic Republic of the Congo, horrendous working conditions. Are you prepared to mine heavily in, I don't know, Greenland or, or uh, here, here again in the United States, we used to mine rare earth in California. There aren't any perfect solutions. There's no easy answer. And, and if the moment you start thinking oh, there's this super easy yeah. answer, and the only thing that's keeping us from adopting this easy answer is like bad Republicans, okay, it's not gonna, it's not gonna fly. I mean, I think about nuclear a lot because um, you have to tackle the question of energy density. Mm -hmm. And nuclear has mm -hmm. two great things going for it, which is it's, I mean, you have to build the plants, obviously, which is not greenhouse neutral. But once you have it, the energy is, is not emitting carbon and it's incredibly energy dense, right? And so it means that you can feed your grid extraordinarily well through this technology. As Gina puts it, small problem, then you have to deal with the waste. It's not a small problem, it's a huge problem, but you can only think about that problem by then not saying, okay, well, that's bad, so we can't do it. It's how bad is it compared to the other solutions that are on the menu right now? And this is exactly why I said what I said earlier about nudges. These are the big, crunchy, gnarly problems yeah. where you've really got to pull the lever on pros and cons, and you can't have someone like Cass, as much as I love him, nudging us in the direction of, say, nuclear power. But, but it's it's going to be harder than that. The other thing that I, I worry about with nuclear, and, and honestly, I'm not like a nutcase against nuclear. I've, I've done a couple of, worked on a couple of decommissioning of these plants, and it's, it's not easy. It's, and it's a lot of money. And the issue is, you know, I'm kind of in favor of people being able to chart their own destiny rather than the government building 12 things and saying, call it a day. What does that do to damage our markets in so many other creative ways that may be directly beneficial and preferable to human beings? Like you said, you may want to have triple pane windows. You may want to do energy efficiency to the max. You may want to look at, at other solutions that that actually may rob you of. Because it's a... Sh oh, it's now you a can say whatever you want. We talk I, about this no, in the no, green room. I'm, my husband would be so angry with me because I do this all the time. It, that's 
that's a shitload of money. Yeah. Right? And why do we want, why, you, you kind of now backing yourself into the government's going to pick a winner and everybody's going to have to eat it. Not everybody's going to want that. I want, I want creative, community driven, individual homeowner solutions that I can have a house that's completely energy efficient, that I can buy clean energy to, to drive, to, to, to manage, and I think that's within reach. I honestly do. Yes, and I, I think that would cut the conversation a lot if that became the strategy. I agree so with you. So that's all. The inside joke is that we had to have a little pep talk in yes. the green room about not cussing because we all like to do it. But you've, you've broken. <laughs> I've broken the ice. You, yeah, I think me. we're all in. That's we're all in good. now. So we're talking about nuclear, Brett. You asked the question. I, I actually think it was a really smart question. So I'm going to take you back to your piece from the fall last year. You came out and talked about a lot of different technologies. You talked about, obviously, uh, nuclear power. You talked about hydro. You talked about storage. You talked even about a carbon tax. You even said that we could take people's, now I'm, I'm putting words in your mouth a bit, but you talked about taking SUVs off the table as a way to make uh, a big impact on climate change. But what I didn't sense was SUVs are a big problem. I mean, you, you were probably doing yourself more of a favor environmentally by just driving a smaller car than buying a Tesla. I agree with you. I agree with you on the all the text those... of this conversation is I can't stand Elon Musk. Well, that we actually right, have a lot of common a there as well. I mean, so, you know, I quit there Twitter. Could and be I, you unanimity know, on that. There was a question in the first panel about, like, what can you do as a young person to sort of, like, make a dent on, on climate and climate misinformation? Information, delete your social media, delete your Twitter, delete your Instagram, delete your Snap. Just that's get rid of all that climate. stuff. That's good for your soul. It's good for everything. <laughs> it's good for everything. But here, I'm going to go back to my question. I didn't sense that you were coming out in favor of anything. You were sort of like putting this all out there as a menu of things that we could or should do. But I didn't hear Brett Stevens saying, I think we should I mean, do. Brett uh. Stevens should not be commenting on this. What the hell does Brett Stevens know about what the best solution is? You know, I every that, morning I read it. I mean, I, I, I asked, asked my wife same. asked that <laughs> question. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much about yeah. every, every. Who is this guy? Every week, no. But that was that was quite deliberate. The point is, it, it's a huge menu of of possibilities. Let's not limit ourselves to two, okay? Let's 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 be imaginative. And you know, we were saying this a little bit earlier in our uh, earlier conversation we had with, with with some of the wonderful students here. You know, when you start complexifying an issue. It spreads, right? You start to see all kinds of ways in which things are difficult. Uh, but when you do that and you, you enter into that complex conversation, you realize like, oh, I'm spreading into an area with, with Gina McCarthy right here, which I never would have had if we were having a simplified conversation because we would contract to our core position. Yeah. So everything that involves complexity with climate actually creates opportunities, not for total consensus, but definitely for overlap. And a lot of that overlap can be really creative and productive. You know, I've always liked you. I'm starting to like you a lot oh, better. Don't, don't. <laughs> this is actually getting getting fun for me. So in a second, we're going to have... You don't know me well enough. <laughs> well, I'd like to get to know you better. We're going to have questions from the audience in a second. I'm going to ask students to line up on my left here and everyone else who's not a student to line up on my right. i got time for one more question, Gina. This is going to be yep. to you. You talked earlier about the IPCC and, you know, it's, 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 it's a problem. It's a very serious problem. It's a very, very serious problem. Yep. I've actually written about and come out a lot really critical of the IPCC because I feel like after how many decades of IPCC reports, I just keep reading the same yeah. thing over and over and over again. If I have to hear one more time that the IPCC is not going to be sort of in on the policy but is just sort of giving us science, I, I feel like I'm going to scream or worse. So I, I'd like you to either talk me out of my despair about the IPCC or share with me your thoughts about how a, a body like the IPCC or some other body could do a better job of actually moving us as a society toward common ground on climate change. Yeah, you know, I've been pretty frustrated by the IPCC because of the language they use and and they're but also you know they're doing what you you are hopping a little bit on in a in a good way which is they're the most depressing things I've ever read <laughs> you know the, and maybe rightfully so but they don't they've begun to not add value in the conversation you know so it, it, it so I think it's great to articulate a problem but maybe 
maybe the answer is not just having scientists do papers, but there's got to be folks sitting down and fashioning the solutions, <laughs> because that's what's going to matter. You know, I, it, I used to, when I was first talking about climate change, I mean, I spent 20 years of climate deniers, you know, on the Hill and in states and stuff, and, and it was always very frustrating to me. Uh, to have to continually talk about, about this challenge and try to get people motivated to act. But I don't see a lot of climate deniers anymore. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I used to do, and, is, and I'm going to make you do it, is I used to, what, to get people off the climate denier thing, I used to tell them that they have to repeat after me, and now you're going to have to repeat after me. Number one, climate change is real. Climate change, is real. Climate change is real. Number two, man-made emissions have caused it. Man-made emissions have caused it. Which is why women need to rule the world. <laughs> Which is why women need to rule the world. I have my answer. <laughs> So I'm going to start asking folks to line up, and while they do, Brett, I'm going to ask you to, 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 to see if you want to comment on what Gina just said about women ruling the world or anything else. Thank you for repeating. <laughs> oh, well, yeah, women ruling the world, yes. Yes, I agree. <laughs> IPCC, I, 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 I actually, look, first of all, the most depressing thing I've ever read was um, uh, Mariano Azuela's novel, Los de Abajo, which is a totally different story uh, about the Mexican Revolution. Uh, no, I actually value IPCC reports, and I do my best to read as much of them as I can. I think it's good to have the state of the science presented in some form. Um, and I know these meetings are expensive, and I, I think there's a huge value there. And um, so I just I, think uh, there needs to be a companion piece with it, not by the scientists, but, but by I, normal I people. Think yeah. But look, one thing I'll say in this respect is, uh, this was a point, I, 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 it was the one point I wanted to make before we got on the panel and didn't manage to make it. The only way you have this conversation fruitfully is if it's not dominated by climate scientists. Mm -hmm. They have a hugely valuable role in the conversation. Mm -hmm. um, but a climate scientist is not an economist. A climate That's scientist right. is not a public That's policy right. expert. A climate scientist doesn't have to deal with a variety of constituents across the income ladder. A climate scientist is not a diplomat trying to negotiate an accord with China or India on, on emissions reductions. And there is a side of the climate science that says, okay, Okay, since we know all about climate, we know all about everything yep. else. No, lots of voices have to be represented at this table. Yep. Everyone has a say. Absolutely. Good, good point. All right, more common ground. I'm, I'm really she starting. Like, I'm really enjoying this now. <laughs> so I think we're going to take a first question from the watch party. I feel like it's going to be a Michigan State University question. I'm waiting for the prompter. The they call this a confidence prompter. I'm not feeling very confident at the moment. Here we go. This is a question for Gina. How can we make sure that when we implement more renewable energy that we give equal access to all communities and not ignore communities that are struggling financially? Basically, how can we best implement renewables in poor communities? Well, the one thing that, that we certainly tried to do was to, to make it very clear that at least 40% of, of the investment needed to go into um, communities that had been disadvantaged for far too long. It, I mean, it, it's not just that they've been left behind. A lot of it is, is racial segregation, redlining. I mean, we see a lot of communities, and those are the communities that would be most benefited by any of the investments. So if you want to really stretch a dollar, that's where you go. So we, I, I know that there's a tracking system for how the money is being spent. There's an obligation uh, that that 60 billion of, of the money that's in the Inflation Reduction Act be dedicated to communities that have been left behind, your environmental justice communities. And it's I, I think it's going to be very difficult to implement. Um, but I also think if you do your job and look at the, the actual benefits of investments, you'll see that 
that that's where the investments are most needed. I think one of the challenges that we're facing right now is that when there's a lot of effort on the part of NGOs, which is great, to actually engage with NGOs in those communities and try to build up the capacity of those communities to actually participate in what is often a horrendous process, you know, of how do you do grant applications, how do you put the money to work, and how do you, you know, fill out the paperwork. And so there's a lot of the work that's being done, but it's a wholly different framing from environmental justice communities who have been built up to stop things that are bad when I really need them to stand up and go, I want the money. Mm -hmm. It's got to come to me. These are the benefits that it would accrue to communities that have are living in poverty or are living in in, in the shadows of terrible facilities. So we, we've, we've really got to do our work and our homework to make sure that the money is tracked but invested properly and that it's properly looked at from an economic perspective because I think those communities will win every single time if it is. Yeah, and to the person who asked the question at MSU, I, I'm heartened by the fact that at, uh, at the DOE that's led by Jennifer Granholm, there is an energy justice group that's focusing on exactly this question. So I'm going to go to uh, the line on my left, fight on. Welcome to Climate Forward. Thank you very much. My name is Sean. I'm an undergraduate at the business school, and I'm going to read this off my phone to feign eloquence. Okay. Uh, so capitalistic markets growth is based on the framework of exponential growth. However, our natural resources used in these markets are limited and ever receding. Given this and your experience, what can young entrepreneurs and business leaders do to drive that change to a more sustainable system if that change is necessary? Who are you asking the question to? Uh, Anyone? I'd say, I'd say both, but uh, particularly to G. Oh, God, don't make me do it. I'm, I'm a terrible economist. Um, I don't know. What do you Pass? Think? Are you passing? No, I mean, I'll, I'll, and look, you know, you find a price uh, is the answer. But um, uh, I went to Chicago, so it's all about finding yeah. a price. Um, Look, uh, yes, that, that, that's, that, that's true what you're saying. On the other hand, um, uh, we've been predicting peak oil uh, for 52 years. Yeah. I think the first prediction came out 50 years ago. And um, what we're discovering, actually, the story of the last 50 years is extraordinary mineral abundance. We haven't even begun to scratch the surface in terms of some of the critical minerals that we're going to need for uh, a, a transition with, with respect to vehicles. So when I was in Greenland, for example, chances are you haven't heard of this place, Disco Island. It's about twice the size of uh, Long Island, um, has a population of maybe 1,000 people. And the estimates in terms of its, I think it's um, cobalt, I have to remind myself of the, of the metal, um, is that it has as least as much as the Norilsk mine in Russia, which was the premier supplier of it for the last uh, 75 years. So we're going to end up finding all kinds of critical minerals minerals that we need all over the place. And that's going to be a consuming fixation of the global economy, I think, for the next 150 years, just as um, oil was for the last 150 years. That, that I don't think, is, is the challenge. I think what the, the challenge is going to be finding the right mix of energy solutions that is as environmentally sustainable as possible. Um, and sufficiently cost effective that it can be that it can have a really wide application and not just be the kind of hobby horse of the well to do. Gina? The only thing I would add is that I, I think the complexity that people are beginning to get their arms around and when you talk about critical minerals and other things is that you know, it essentially sets up the potential for winners and losers, right? And I think the, the there it's got to be a dialogue um, for in the climate space and at the UN and others on how to make sure that resources are shared and opportunities are shared. And it's it's you know th there's been a real hoopla. I love that word hoopla um, uh, about uh, some of the 
provisions in the Inflation Reduction Act that require domestic content. There's only one, actually, that does, and it's electric vehicles. The rest provide tax credits and other things. But it's raised a real issue with the EU and others about how they can get their vehicles into the U.S. And within the span of, like, three weeks, they just negotiate deals, you know? The Japan's got a deal now. The EU's got a deal to figure out how you can make sure that your trading partners are given and facilitated to have negotiations so that you're advancing everybody's interests. The problem is we have no big international discussion right now on that. We have COPs, conferences of the parties, that endlessly come out with their little reports in the end, but nobody's really having that that discussion about how to ensure that in a in your climate solutions that are everywhere, that there's fairness or equity internationally about how that lands. It's just not part of the conversation in a way that it needs to be, I think. Thank you for your question. Thank you. My wife just texted me to say that she's enjoying this, that we're doing a good job. So well done. <laughs> I had just like, what? Who's texting me now? Um, there's a lot of people at Mike, so I want to make sure that we uh, ask questions quickly, yep. and we'll try and speed up the, right. the answers yep. as well. The next question comes from our watch party at Notre Dame. This one's for you, Brett. Uh, the paramount principle of ethical journalism is truth and accuracy. How have ethics played a role in your personal experience with climate change, and can journalists change their views on critical issues like climate change over time, and what implications does this have? Yes, <laughs> good ones. Uh, look, uh, um, uh, there, there are a series of questions, but um, obviously, number one, uh, climate journalism cannot be social activism. And I think there is a risk that a lot of people who are essentially social activists view journalism as a vehicle for achieving um, uh, an agenda. It might be a great agenda, but the role for, if you want to be a social activist, go be a social activist. Uh, journalism should be as uh, objective uh, and uh, uh, as, as, as possible and adhere to standards of accuracy, fairness, and, uh, uh, and so on. And, that's, and, 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 and th there's been a problem, I think, with a certain amount of journalism in, in the climate space in that it, it tends to veer into uh, a, a kind of activism. In my case, I'm an opinion journalist, right? I still have to be accurate and truthful. I get scrupulously fact-checked by a really tough fact-checkers looking at, uh, um, at, uh, at uh, every line. But I, I, I have a slightly wider field of play in terms of my, my ability to interpret. But it is so important to be able to, to model uh, the importance of changing your mind on a subject on which you've taken a big stand. People who don't change their minds, right, at some level aren't thinking. If, if you're so sure that at the age of 20 or 40 or 60 or even 80, you're right about everything, for sure you're wrong. And it's very, and it's necessary, especially now where we're all in our silos and we're all so damn sure about what we think, to be able to say, hang on a second, maybe I was wrong. And to show how you take a reader, and this, you know, my, my October article wasn't really about climate. It was about changing your mind. Mm -hmm. That was, and changing your mind thoughtfully and openly. And that's good, I think, not just for, for opinion journalism. I think it's good for the country if more people could say, hang on a second, maybe I'm not right about everything. Here, here. You've been I tell waiting. my husband that all the time. Wow. Maybe he isn't right about everything. You have been waiting so patiently. Welcome to Climate Forward. Okay, so my name is Hannah, and my question is on nuclear energy, so it's understandable if it's already been answered. But this is mainly for you. Where do you view uh, nuclear energy as a temporary as a temporary transition fuel, or do you see it as more of a permanent fuel source that? will occur in the future. I, I think because of the cost of nuclear and the, the h how long its shelf life is, <laughs> that it, it, it's, I think it's as permanent a system as we probably have. And, I th and that's what concerns me. Okay. <laughs> 
Welcome. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jenna. Um, I'm a PhD student in the Marine Biology Department. Um, one theme that I've picked up from both of you is that pessimism is not an effective communication strategy on this issue. Um, however, I study coral reefs, um, and so the situation for the organisms that I study really is rather dire. And I wonder if you both have an opinion on, like, is there a more effective way that we can use these examples of ecosystems that really are in a tough spot um, to more effectively uh, motivate? people to take action on the issue of climate change? Well, I, you know, I, I, I am trying to get across the fact that people won't run away from you if you're optimistic. You know, I, I have three little kids, I had three little kids in three years. The, the goal was to keep them happy and to move forward and to teach them things. Uh, if all I did was tell them no all the time, you're, you're, you're up the creek without a paddle, right? And, and it's the true of adults. You want to be sort of enticed to change. You want to be optimistic. That does not mean that we should be naive to the realities of what's going on in the world. So please don't take it that way. The challenge of coral reefs are, is an enormous problem. I would argue that it's an economic problem and it's an international governance challenge because it's not the individual countries that are creating the problem. It's the international markets that are demanding, you know, change that is unsustainable. You know, they're just sucking the ocean dry of fish. It's amazing. And the, of course, the, the coral reefs are, are, are challenged because of the, the bleaching. Um, and so we know this is a problem. So I'm not suggesting we, we put a, a happy bow on the challenge of climate change. We have to be realistic about it. But th there are lots of opportunities to regrow coral, I hope. Um, many are being tried. But you, you have to be honest and, and recognize that it's a tremendous threat to the economy of many island nations and many countries if, if those coral reefs deteriorate and the overfishing continues. So I, I'm going to challenge Gina from the left, bizarrely. Um, I think wow. loss of biodiversity is fundamentally an ethical challenge for the human species. That's true. And you know, one thing I emphasized in my, my piece in October is that in some sense climate is fundamentally or could be fundamentally a conservative cause because not only was Teddy Roosevelt the first great conservationist uh, president, obviously a Republican, um, but uh, more importantly, if what your, if, if the fundamental conservative view is that you have fiduciary obligations to future generations that you will never meet, if that's true about social security solvency, right, then how much more true does it have to be with respect to the biodiversity uh, question? Because you are therefore depriving future generations of the yeah. opportunities to see life on this earth flourish in as many forms uh, uh, possible. So it's not even like, even if all the economics were to say, you know, we, we yeah. can do without coral reefs, right? I think there's a huge case to make that we just can't accept that as a species. We have, we have a, a a fundamental obligation to something, uh, to a living ecosystem like that. That's terrific. But do you really think that you didn't part see that of the, the, no, I did, it's great. <laughs> uh, uh, I, I'm having trouble recognizing conservative Republicans in, in the way that you you articulate them. I'm having real but, trouble. But look, with that. It, it depends on how you speak to conservatives, right? People, most of the time, people don't know their own mind, right? There's this kind of swirl of, ugh, and then shit comes out of your mouth, right? <laughs> Here we right. go. Here okay. we go. Sorry, I had to. I feel. No, I, I know. I mean, I, she's got one. You got one. I didn't one. want to be the only one. My turn. One. Even the score, yeah. right? My so, turn. So, uh, so there are opportunities for persuasion. There are opportunities to speak to people within their own value system and make them see that according to their value system, they should have different ideas about policy options and outcomes. 
the moment you challenge someone's value system and say you're just greedy, okay, they're just gonna say go to hell, I'm not greedy or whatever, right? But if you say, look, if you see yourself as a conservative and if a conservative fundamentally believes that there is this intergenerational trust that goes beyond us, right? That, that in fact we owe something to God's creation um, to be stewards of, of this earth, right? Then, uh, by the way, that, that comes from Genesis. Um, then you might actually start to talk to people in a language they hadn't even considered for themselves. That in fact, the market, much as I love the market, right? Up to a point, up to a point I love the market, there are other considerations in life, not the least of which is, is the flourishing of what God created for us. And that's, that, that should not be, I mean, it's certainly a liberal value. There's no reason it shouldn't be a conservative one too. What's interesting about this though is it goes back to this huh. philosophical question about what's normal, right? We started changing the planet as humans 200 plus years ago. The planet was changing even before then. We so, started changing 10,000 years ago. So what, what normal should should we, be, would, should we be shooting for? And that's not a question that I hope that we, had, I mean, I'd love to talk about it, but we don't have time. I want to, let's talk about it more in the green room, but I'm going to go back to uh, the, the room and see what your question is. Hi, my name is Ume. Um, you guys had previously discussed a bit the role of the federal government in addressing the climate crisis, and I was wondering both of your opinions on a Green New Deal. Oh, Brett, this is like, this is teed up for you. <laughs> Well, Green New Deal was very expensive. And unfortunately, on this planet, we have competing priorities. So like it or not, um, the environment is not the only priority for a government with limited resources. One of the early questions was on, on re, you know, literally resource limitation. And, and so you have to make, make choices. If you were to have a, what was it, initially proposed, like a $4.6 trillion Green New Deal, it would have been probably economically disastrous because when you actually think what $4.6 trillion is, it reminds me of a movie called Brewster's Millions, which was remade. Uh, with Richard Pryor. With, it's great. Yeah. Where the guy just has to spend $20 million or $30 million a month. Turns out it's super hard, okay? Try spending $4.6 trillion even over 10 years and try spending that responsibly. Try spending that without corruption. It's really problematic. So, so you just have to start thinking about, well, okay, you can conjure any number, right? But there are gonna be consequences you want, and particularly for something like the IRA, you want your first big program to be a winner. Right, because you're gonna have a next iteration of this yeah. program in 10 or 15 years. And if the memory is, that was the biggest fe federal government fiasco in history, the future Congresses aren't gonna repeat it. So model what you're doing before you go big. Gina? The only other thing I'd add is that I, I, I think we can't be pretentious. Do you know, that that was monumental. And, and I think, I, I much prefer the the style of you know what you're doing, you're going to act on it, you 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 move forward, and then you do it again, and then you. I don't. I'm not a big believer in monumental solutions being offered that may in the end get you nowhere fast. Um, so I, I, so I. I Jeez, why are we always agreeing? It's I don't know, I know. It's common ground. Thank you for your question. The next question comes from Michigan State. I love this question because I spent All the years. questions, what about Vanderbilt? I, I'm just reading the, the confidence prompter. I, I don't know what to say. Um, I like this question because before I came here, I spent a decade in, in business schools. And this question, I mean, relates to something that I saw. I saw so many companies when I, companies when I was in the B school talking about how they were all in on sustainability and sustainability is in our DNA. Um, and it just, it just wasn't, if we're being honest. So this is a question about, about greenwashing. As we get deeper and deeper into not only the climate crisis, but climate solutions, a lot of companies are going to claim to be fighting climate change, but they're probably going to be uh, greenwashing to both of you, how can we motivate companies to make more genuine efforts toward environmental sustainability without getting into the dirty business of greenwashing? 
Well, just r right now, uh, greenwashing is very difficult because the carbon credit system is on hold <laughs> because there's been so much greenwashing. So there's there's a lot of work going on between now and in the fall with a variety of groups that are getting together to try to figure out how a credit system or an offset system could actually be legitimate uh, and, and, and move forward in some ways, particularly to to, to attract investment in, in other countries. Um, so I, 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 the greenwashing has been quite obvious and, and well documented. Um, and, but there has to be a system, I think, put in place that provides the stability that we're looking for and the visibility into these companies. But I, I would just had to add, have to add, and this is, is uh, n not to the right of you, I'm to the left maybe. Uh, if, if a fossil fuel company tells you that they're, 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 they're going to be sustainable, they're not. I, I just, I, you just cannot put a good face on, on fossil fuel. You just can't. Yeah, you can clap. You can, yeah. I would actually, the same way with petrochemicals, because they are fossil fuel companies. So You're sitting quietly. I'm ready to move on, but I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm I've, I've been so enjoying agreeing with Gina that I hate to break the, the, the mood music here, but uh, um, most of your fertilizer requires natural gas. You want to grow food, you're going to need natural gas. The roads you drive on take uh, petroleum pot products, bitumen. Um, we are cleaner and better off because we were able to make a almost unseen transition from coal to natural gas in terms of a lot of our um, uh, a lot of our electricity power generation. And I would hope that um, if um, India or China can't move to renewables, natural gas is a heck of a lot better. Than coal. So again, the options are not like the bad guys versus the good guys. The option is, is it a little better? If it's a little better, then think about it. Don't, don't, don't dismiss it. And, and I really feel this way. The moment we get into a demonization scheme with anyone, right, you're on a losing road. You're, you're just going to be on a losing road politically. Uh, I, uh, uh, there's the saying about lobbying in Washington, you have no enemies, you only have friends and potential friends. Um, it's, it's politically very, very wise to operate on the friends or potential friends uh, 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 mindset. Um, better to have, or, or you know, to one up uh, Gina on the, on the foul mouth department, uh, LBJ's famous phrase, would you rather have them inside the tent pissing out or outside the tent pissing in? <laughs> okay, on that note. Um, <laughs> we have about eight minutes left before I ask you guys the final wrap-up question, just so that if you're in line, you can gauge. But it's looking pretty good, I think. Over to you. Yeah, uh, thank you all for coming out today. Uh, my name is Jack. I'm a psychology student here at USC. Uh, so, Joe, if, if you would like to touch this one, feel Oh, I would love to. Uh, I don't know what it is, but I want to touch it. So so uh, I wanted to ask something similar to the other speakers before, but what if what what is your opinion, each of you, on uh, whether or not the power grid that we have to supply is sustainable? How can we change maybe? And and the the motivation might not be. Uh, in each individual, but how can we make strides to change the system, I, to make it less consumer focused, less product focused? Uh, I don't know. I, 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 like you were saying, there's a lot of stuff and stuff comes out. So uh, I hope that made sense. It made enough sense. I'm not going to answer it, though. I'm going to look to you Why guys not? first. Well, because you're smarter than me, both of you. <laughs> no, you're not. But. Uh, <laughs> Well, you are. I don't know. I don't. Well, are we done? Is yeah. Smarter than I am. There's there's a lot of um, effort now to try to figure out how to have a grid system that really can operate with.
with significant amount of renewables and 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 be successful. There's a lot of challenges with how the grid system is managed and how pipelines are managed. So if you want to get into all that, we can, but it's very difficult. Uh, some of it's absolutely archaic and needs change. But we need investment in the grid. There is no question about it, and it needs to be done fast um, if we actually want to accelerate in, in the way that we have the potential to accelerate. And, and you need regulatory reform, because one of the Absolutely. absurdities now is like where, where the wind is is not necessarily where you need it. Yep. You got transmission lines, and a lot of nimbyism preventing those transmission lines from coming into the process. So this is another area where the moment you stop to think about it, look, if you say to a, a Republican renewables, they'll go, oh, screw that. If you say deregulation so that you can move electricity from the middle of the country, the wind belts of this country to the coast, they'll be like, oh, okay, now we're talking, right, you know? Yeah, That's it's interesting to, I mean, since you asked me to, to, to chime in, I mean, I'm gonna um, pick up something that, uh, that Brett said earlier. I really feel like when it comes to a lot of the issues, whether it's energy transmission, deregulation, different portfolios of options that we could we could be pursuing on the energy front, people have uh, come at it from a position of their sort of political positions and not from the perspective necessarily of their underlying values. And I feel like we've lost the ability to largely change our minds on a lot of these issues. In part, I was sort of eavesdropping on you in the green room earlier today, that whether you're on, I think, the left, you know, super Super kind of stridently pro-climate, uh, or on the right, pro you know, let's call it pro-market or pro-Trump or whatever you want to call it. You have to wear your political ideology like a badge of honor, and you can't deviate from it. And I think that if we return to our values, it would allow us to start seeing these as questions, not answers. And if we started to explore them from the perspective of answering questions, we might actually be compelled to change our minds from time to time, and even agree occasionally, like we see to be doing up here on the stage right now. More than occasionally. I know. I think this is going to be the last question from the audience, and then I'm going to ask a follow, a, a final uh, wrap-up question. Hi, everyone. My name is Alexandra. Thank you for being here today. Um, I just had a quick question, um, seeking advice. Um, obviously, everyone in this room cares a little bit about the climate crisis in one way or another, but my um, question is, how do we approach people who are complacent on the issue or not doing much about um, addressing climate change. I, I believe, you know, everyone can't have Brett's experience where they see a glacier melting in Greenland. So how do we approach people on the day-to-day -day basis um, and hopefully have them be concerned a little more than they are now? Well, what did it for me wasn't necessarily going to Greenland. It was that the oceanographer who approached me wasn't a dick. <laughs> <laughs> Now we're really devolving. Yeah. No, but I, I really mean that. I, I cannot tell you what it means when a guy comes up to you and says, you know, you seem like a really good guy. You're obviously pretty smart. I think I can help you see something in a different way. So number one, just don't be one of those censorious, moralizing, finger-wagging, you bad person. You're never going to win. By the way, never mind climate, any other issue. Also, marriage, relationships, you name it. Bad, bad, bad strategy in life. Second of all, model behavior. Right? Because one thing I can tell you from uh, past life as a climate skeptic is that there's nothing more loathsome than uh, climate activists taking private jets to Abu Dhabi to you know, stay in air-conditioned hotels to discuss the climate crisis. So modeling behavior is, 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 is hugely uh, important. And, and the third thing is, uh, I get back to this word, which is a, something of a neologism, but I think it's useful, complexify. Um, because when you complexify, when you, you, you really sort of see things at the first, second, third order, right? it sparks conversations. It sparks, you find areas of connection that you didn't think that you were going to have before. I know there's this tendency you want to ruthlessly simplify. You want to have three points, and I'm completely on, on all of them, including women rule the world, but, but, um, but that actually, that is, I think, the worst side of it because the people who are on the other side actually have thoughtful and honest questions. 
And if you address them that way, think about them that way, they're going to be responsive. If you think of them as stupid or evil, they're going to they're going to be the turtles in their shell. But but I think your question was not how, how do you fight a climate denier as much as how do you get more people engaged, right? And I think I, I still think that that being positive about the benefits of the change and what they can do for themselves and for their grandchildren is where my heart would lie. You know, and, and, if, and I think if you do that, you, people will engage, but some people are, you know, we're in challenging times, and you're not going to win everybody and engage them, but, but just try to be real and understand where they're coming from and, and do things that meaningfully tell people about the opportunities they might have. And that'll, that, that'll be enough. Thank you. Thank you. So lightning round, That's lightning round. But I'm just kidding, we don't have a lightning round. We have one last question, and it's, it's, I think, an easy one, but also a very important and, for that reason, difficult one. What gives the two of you hope that we can actually come together, find common ground, and actually take real meaningful steps to address the climate challenge? And I'm not talking about philosophical steps. I'm talking about, you know, lunch pails and hard hats kinds of steps, things that will bring people together from across the political spectrum to make change does you know what if anything gives you hope that we can do it in the near future two to five years uh, who, who first to toss up uh, Brett Oh, I'm tremendously hopeful. Um, why? Because climate is going to be an area that is going to engage not just our fears, but um, our hopes. And uh, it's going to engage an incredible amount of creativity, um, enterprise, uh, profits also, um, uh, uh, a kind of idealism, which, um, you know, look, I grew up in Mexico City. Believe it or not, in my experience, I've lived in Belgium, Britain, I've lived in the Middle East, I've lived in Germany. America's still the most optimistic can do country uh, in the world. People want to solve stuff here. And, um, you know, it's interesting that in, in America's two great founding documents, you find two f f redolent phrases, the, the pursuit of happiness and a more perfect union. And these are, it's amazing that our founders had it within them to express themselves in terms that were fundamentally aspirational. It's not about who we were or even who we are, it's about who we want to be. And that goes deep into the American psyche. So, you know, wherever you go in this country, people are really engaged um, on this issue uh, with this crisis. There's just a lot of brain power going uh, into this thing. So should we, we be optimistic? Yeah, I think we should be really optimistic. There's some good and smart people who want to uh, save the world and uh, they're likely to succeed. You know, I, let me just very quickly add that I, I'm more hopeful than I've ever been before. Um, I mean, we've been fighting in the trenches for 30 years trying to get get answers to, to the world's most challenging problem. And I think we have solutions now that we've never had before. I'm confident that we can, can land those solutions and, and advance them and there'll be more to follow. But I also, in, and I, I don't say this in a, in a trite way or just because I'm here, but I feel like this generation uh, that are asking these questions are the smartest and, and most compelling of advocates on climate that, that I've ever seen. There's just no question that we have to act. And I'm, and I'm certain that, that this generation will keep pushing as hard as it needs to push. And so I'm, I'm really bullish on the opportunity for a clean energy future to become a reality sooner rather than later. Well, 
our fun has, has, has pretty much come to an end. I want to uh, give some thank yous real quick. Uh, first of all, thank you to everybody who's watching uh, online, on Zoom, on Facebook. I, I'm kind of curious, uh, Michigan State, Notre Dame, and Vandy, is that a loop? Are you guys really there? Can you wave if you're actually there? All right, thank you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you to uh, all of our, our watch party students. Um, thank you to the teams that I have an enormous privilege in, in working with my own WISE team, uh, the Wrigley Institute team, Catherine Royster, Jessica, Amber Brown, Marcella, Allison. Thank you guys so very much for all the hard work that you do behind the scenes to make this real. Um, uh, to my friends at Climate, uh, to Center for the Political Future, Kami, Nicole, Bob, uh, every year we do this and you're absolutely remarkable, so thank you. Uh, Common Ground Committee, you guys are great. Thank you so much. Gina, Brett, you know, I have to say, I was a little nervous about this because I thought this could go like a lot of different ways. It could be a shit show. It could have been, it could have been a real shit show. Yeah. But it wasn't. I, uh, I really we had a lot so of fun. We are so juvenile. I know. But what I liked most about this is that, is that, you know, we had a real conversation. I think you guys, you were able to find common ground and you were able to disagree respectfully, which I really admire about both of you. I've long admired you. I've, I've cursed your name in the kitchen a couple of times like can you believe that but you know what you're, you're well, not I, a bad I, guy I live for that you're not a bad guy so uh, Brett Gina it, it's a tremendous honor and privilege to spend an hour and a half with you thank you so very, very much for everything you shared uh, and with that I'm gonna turn uh, the microphone back uh, over to my friend Bruce so uh, come on up Bruce back at you Joe right. thank you Joe, thank you so much, and this was just such an amazing conversation, as you said. I, really not a lot to add to that. Certainly, again, lived up to the Common Ground Committee motto of bringing light, not heat, to public discourse in such a wonderful way. So after listening tonight, uh, I hope that the discussion that you heard here, uh, as our panelists suggested, has given you uh, a sense of uh, hope that we can bridge our political divides and that you've gained some inspiration to perhaps act differently, to engage in your own conversations with more understanding and with an eye toward a positive ad, uh, outcome rather than just trying to win the argument. And we really value your input on this event. So I'm going to ask if you would please uh, take a short survey that you can access using the QR code up here. Also, you can get it from our website. We're partnering with another organization called Ecology. And for every survey we get back, they will plant five trees for you. So please share your feedback with us. We'd really appreciate it. So much gratitude for the Center for the Political Future and for the Wrigley Institute, uh, especially Kami Akavan, Nicole Pompeo, Christy Plaza, Jessica Dutton, and Catherine Royster. Thank you all for being with us today and to Gina and Brett. We are so inspired by what you had to say today. You've given us hope for where we're going to go. We've learned from you. It was just a wonderful conversation. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank you. Thank you.